So my, my topic is also on ultrasound and anesthesia, but I'm taking a more of an overview approach and we'll be talking about peripheral nerves today. So uh, before I get into my presentation, I just want to talk about my personal experience with ultrasound in anesthesia. Um, I shadowed an anesthesiologist last year who did a lot of these peripheral nerve blocks for surgeries involving the legs or the arms. Um, and I also got to see an epidural nerve block, but that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. So my presentation is adapted from this review by um, Nawaka and Miller. It is just a review of common procedures seen in the outpatient setting using ultrasound. So I hope everyone gets something out of this. All right, so why do we use ultrasound in anesthesia? It's found in research that ultrasound is sensitive and specific in the diagnosis of peripheral neuropathy. And so you can actually use your ultrasound device to visually confirm the neurological degeneration. You can even see compression of the nerve. And you would also see if the nerve has sort of anechoic areas that can also be an indication that you have neuropathy. And so compared to other imaging methods, and I'll get into this in just a minute, but MRI is a comparable fidelity with ultrasound, but MRI is not indicated in people who have, um, I guess you could say high body habitus, um, as you have to maneuver them into the MRI scanner itself. Whereas with an ultrasound device, you can just, you can come to the patient themselves and image them directly. So um, it's quick, it's cheap, and it's also very targeted. I found in reading the article that um, before the days of ultrasound, the anesthesiologist would have to just have blind guesswork. They have to have good knowledge of anatomy to see where nerves are. Whereas with ultrasound, they can have direct visual confirmation of where the nerves are. And so that allows them to deliver a more accurate um, uh, injectant of anesthesia. It's also, uh, they, have to, they don't have to use as much anesthesia either. So you, you don't have to um, potentially have a, a longer lasting nerve weakness. Um, and so I also wanted to bring up the idea of sonopalpation, which we've been doing in our selective just um, uh, rocking and fanning the probe to directly image the structure of interest. Okay, so to talk more about MRI versus ultrasound in terms of imaging. So uh, MRI and ultrasound are both frequently used as imaging or for image guided procedures. However, the drawback of MRI is that you can't use it in real time. Whereas with ultrasound, you can go directly up to the patient who's lying on an operating room table and image their nerves directly. It also requires a dedicated room for MRI. And like I said, with patient maneuvering, it's difficult. You also need special needles if you're doing a peripheral nerve block that involves MRI. And so this image I have here, I just wanted to talk briefly. This is an MRI scan of a schwannoma, which is a tumorous mass of cells, of Schwann cells of the median nerve. So um, that's what it would look like on, ultra, on MRI, excuse me. And so to go to ultrasound, like I said, it's uh, less time consuming, it's cheaper, and it can be done readily. Um, and there's also a, um, because it's more precise, you don't have to use as much anesthetic. Okay, so I want to talk briefly about this as well. So this is what nerves will look like on ultrasound. And we did see this yesterday with the brachial plexus. So um, the epineurium, if you recall, the anatomy of nerves is the outer sheath of the nerve bundle itself and it's going to look hyperechoic. And so the example I have here is the musculocutaneous nerve. And then the perineurium is going to be hypoechoic. And what I have there pictured is the ulnar nerve. And if you're going to visualize the more internal bundles of nerves themselves, they're going to be that honeycomb appearance that you can see. Um, and I believe that we did see that yesterday during our scanning. Um, so. I uh, neglected to mention earlier that the way that you hold the probe during ultrasound anesthesia procedures is going to be in short axis. And so going back here, this is a short axis view of these nerves. Um, and so going back to this, uh, for deeper nerves like the sciatic nerve, you're going to use a low frequency probe such as the curvilinear probe. And that allows you to penetrate deeper into the tissue and image the nerve better. And for a more superficial nerve, like the median nerve, you'll use a high frequency linear probe. Okay, and one thing that is very bad to do is an intraneural injection. 
And so this is one of the main benefits of ultrasound as well, is that it allows you to uh, bypass an intraneural injection, because if that happens, you could have axonal degeneration. And in the review that I read, that was actually seen in animal models where they did intraneural injections. You had consequent loss of axons and resulting um, weakness in the muscles. And so um, I also read that there is that while the intraneural injection is a very high risk thing to do, it um, there are advantages to it. However, it's not uh, because of the risks involved, it's most likely not going to be performed. OK, so quick facts about the injectant itself. So I found that the clinical volume of injectant used is about two to five millimeters of injectant used in most cases. And the composition of this injectant, it's a 1% lidocaine solution for general anesthesia plus a corticosteroid. And the corticosteroid is there just to prevent a systemic inflammatory response, or rather a localized inflammatory response to the anesthetic itself. I also found that you could use a 0.25% bupivacaine solution for a diagnostic procedure. And so the needle itself is going to be a 1.5 inch in length needle, which is a 25 or 27 gauge needle for a more superficial nerve like in the hand. And then if you're going to use a deeper nerve or if you're going to find a deeper nerve, you'll use a 22 gauge spinal needle, which is used for ep um, epidural procedures, but you'll use the same thing in a deeper nerve that's in the periphery. Okay, the general procedure of it so the needle must be perpendicular to the transducer beam. And you can see on this ultrasound scan right here on the right of the screen, the needle itself is this sort of um, hyperechoic line that doesn't look like anything inside the body naturally. So that's how you know that you successfully have the needle inside the tissue. And like I said, you have to visualize in the short axis view. And next, the needle must be placed directly adjacent to the echogenic epineurium which as you can see, it's doing that right now in that image. And, but you must not penetrate the epineurium itself. Um, you must confirm a proper position with the nerve itself before you deliver the injectant. And that just, what, what you do with that, you inject a little bit to make sure that um, the flow is going to actually come out of the needle and that it's going to fill the space. Then next you administer the injectant itself. Um, and another important thing to mention is that the patient must not feel any pain during the administration of injectant itself. And so you must also reposition the needle as needed during the administration to achieve something called circumferential coverage. So on the ultrasound, it's going to look like a large bubble that's very um, anechoic. Um, and what that is, is just the injectant that's making a bubble around the nerve. And that's going to essentially bathe the nerve in your anesthetic solution. And so that will cause the loss of sensation that you're looking for. And I also want to point out that this image is of the brachial plexus. And we saw this yesterday where it looks kind of like a stoplight appearance um, on the scan itself. OK, so I just want to talk about a few use cases. So in upper extremity nerves, we have the median nerve. And this is commonly seen in carpal tunnel syndrome, where you have compression of the median nerve. Um, a nerve block here is going to be short term. So um, while there is some evidence to say that a long term um, reduction in pain is possible or a reduction in symptoms is possible with a nerve block, it's mostly indicated in short term use cases. And this is going to happen when physical therapy or a splint is not going to work. So the more conservative treatments have failed in this case. Um, and so you can also achieve that circumferential coverage, like I mentioned, with about two millimeters of injectant. And you're going to see that typically with more superficial nerves. It only requires about two millimeters of, of injectant itself. And so in the ulnar nerve toward the elbow, you'll see this in ulnar neuropathy that's distal to the elbow. Um, like I said, when your more conservative treatments fail, such as elbow splinting and physical therapy, this is when you'll have to use a nerve block here. Um, and uh, same with the medial nerve, long-term efficacy is not strictly indicated, and it also uses two, about two millimeters of injectant. And so with lower extremity, we have the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. And so with this, patients will experience a paresthesia in the lateral and anterior lateral thigh. They experience burning, muscle aches, weakness, uh, numbness, and radiating pain. And as well, two millimeters of injectant is sufficient. And finally, we have the sciatic nerve, which 
um, I found that about 40% of patients, rather one in two patients, excuse me, um, in the American population are going to be experiencing sciatic nerve pain. And all this is, is just compression of the roots of the sciatic nerve, which are from around L4 to S3 of your spinal cord. Um, and we recommend a nerve block when, like I said, the conservative treatments, such as your physical therapy and your, your um, other treatments have failed. And now because the sciatic nerve is one of the largest nerves in the body in terms of diameter, you'll be using five millimeters of injectant volume for um, adequate circumferential coverage. And another important point I want to point out is that you must use a short acting anesthetic to avoid leg weakness in the long term, because if you use a long acting, you'll have a longer duration of, of effect on the nerve itself. And so we don't want that to have patients, you know, lose loss of their leg or that have loss of their leg. We don't want them to have, you know, long-term uh, negative effects from this. So in conclusion, ultrasound is one of the best ways to image nerves during an anesthesia procedure. It is very cheap, it's quick, and it's going to get you the results that you need.